According to the Global Peace Index, Switzerland is one of the 20 most peaceful countries in the world. While this title is remarkable, Switzerland has had its fair share of horrific crimes indeed. Today, we will look at possibly its worst one yet. Michel Perry was born on February 28, 1959 in Neuchâtel, Switzerland, the very day of his parents' wedding anniversary. He was the middle child in a blended family of five children and in 1962, three years following his birth, his family moved to Fribourg, where he would spend the majority of his childhood. To set the scene, Fribourg is a capital city of the canton of the same name and is situated in the French-speaking part of Switzerland, based to the east of the country. The city is located on both sides of the river Sarin, and it is a major economic, administrative and educational centre on the cultural border between French and German-speaking Switzerland. Its old city, one of the best maintained in Switzerland in fact, sits on a small rocky hill above the valley of the Sarin. Currently, its population counts some 40,000 inhabitants. Growing up, Michel had far from a healthy upbringing. He was a daily witness to both mental and physical domestic abuse. Michel's father was said to have been a tyrant and an alcoholic, who would hit his wife without a second thought. Naturally, Michel, who absolutely adored his mother, felt quite the opposite for his father. Not only was his father violent towards his own wife, he was also known to the police for touching young girls on numerous occasions. Speaking of his past and specifically about witnessing his father abuse his mother, Michel was later quoted as saying, quote, I hated my father then, and I often wanted to kill him. And though young Michel loved his mother, she too wasn't the safe haven he hoped to find. In fact, Michel's mother was said to have cared very little about him and been somewhat indifferent, even cold towards him most of the time, which caused him great pain. She was said to leave him alone very often, and he became a lonely child early on. When the family moved to Fribourg, then six years old Michel joined the Bozé Primary School in the Perol district. Michel was described as a quiet, shy student who preferred his own company. As such, he'd rather stay at home, despite his unhappy home situation, and only left the house to attend a local sports club. One day to punish him, his parents sent him to school wearing tights, paired with very tight sports shorts. As feared, his fellow students burst out in laughter when they saw him, leaving Michel to feel humiliated and ashamed. Years later, he'd say that, quote, Since that day, I've always wanted to hurt others. As the years would pass, Michel would retreat more and more each day, almost living like a recluse with only his dog Pachka around as a companion. When this dog died, Michel was unsurprisingly distraught, having lost what was his only friend in the world. Then, at 13, his life was turned upside down. One day, he discovers, at his father's work, pornographic magazines which featured pages upon pages of sadism. At a time, the bondage scenes, and a torture scene in particular, disturbed him. However, soon after, he begins to imagine himself inflicting pain upon his classmates, a drive that would soon grow beyond his control. That same year, Michel comes across a homosexual couple, and it is then that he begins to question his own sexuality, something he hadn't thought about much prior to this point. During Mass, he then opens up to the parish priest, seeking advice on what this could mean for him. At this point, Michel expects to be reprimanded by the priest, however, that was far from what was about to take place. The priest, rather than discourage his sexuality, drags him into a private room only to sexually abuse him. After, he gives Michel a 50 franc note, around $60, and leaves an already fragile Michel absolutely traumatized. Michel later declared, quote, no one understood at the time, I was leaving normal society behind to lock myself up in a myth, a world of my own making. It is worth noting that the priest has always denied that the abuse happened. However, the court that would later try Michel considered this part of his past to be credible. Later, at 15 years old, Michel then attempts to commit his first violent crime. With the hatred for his father having grown out of proportion, Michel decides to grab a kitchen knife and stab him, possibly to death. 
But a then teenager doesn't follow through with his plan. In fact, only a few minutes after initially deciding to stab him, he stops due to a lack of courage. Despite all this, in appearance, Michel continues to lead a normal life. He does the odd job here and there, working as a chimney sweeper in villard le Grand or in the fields harvesting tobacco. With his savings, he buys himself a moped but continues to lead a rather lonely life. Michel would have his first sexual experience around this time with a farmhand. On October 25, 1975, Michel's family moves to Romont, everyone except Michel, that is, who stays behind in Fribourg to work. At the time, he was employed as an apprentice wine waiter in one of the city's biggest restaurants, the Rex. Michel then successfully obtains his third sommelier certificate, a wine waiter certificate, so to speak, and realizes that he's found his passion in life. He begins collecting books on enology and bottle labels, and he even builds a small wine cellar at home. As he finishes his stint at the Rex, Michel then secures a job at another large restaurant, Le Buffet de la Gare, also in Fribourg. Then, in 1978, after three years apart, he decides to resign and go join his family in Romont. In Romont, he then works for La Poularde, a restaurant that also acts as a night and strip club at night, so a step down from his fancy career past. By the end of the year, Michel had given up catering and completely changed his life as he took on a position as a handler at Tetra Pak, a Swedish-Swiss multinational food packaging and processing company. And if you're thinking, why would he abandon his love of wine for a job in packaging? Well, he discovered yet another passion, caving. In fact, he even joined Romans local caving club. He was also said to escape the growing boredom of his everyday life by listening to his favorite musicians, Wagner, Verdi and Jean-Michel Jarre. Then unexpectedly, in 1981, Michel leaves Romans without notifying his family or employer. For eight months, he would then travel around the globe. Postcards reach his mother from the United States, France, Italy and Norway. At this point, nobody knows what he in fact has been up to at this time. Then, in November 1981, he returns home to be greeted with a violent slap by his father, who was furious at his having vanished without saying a word. Shortly after, Michel finds himself a job at a glass factory called Kowalski, where he works as a production manager. At this point, he oversees four employees and makes a comfortable living. He spends his savings on new caving equipment and spends most of his weekends in the cave of Morti Valley, mountain hiking and even attending judo lessons. So all in all, he has quite an active lifestyle. In the evenings, he jumps into his Citroen CX and drives to Johnny's, a gay nightclub in Lausanne, or to the Café des Négociants, a popular meetup spot for homosexual men and women. Despite his evening activities, he continues to hide his sexuality from his relatives. But his father's abuse doesn't stop him from traveling. In fact, whenever he has the chance, he travels abroad, to Poland, former Yugoslavia, Italy, Spain, France and beyond. But unfortunately, it wasn't just his destinations that were slowly multiplying. Then, on May the 7th, 1986, 13-year-old Cédric Antil is reported missing by his parents. Cédric was described as a serious young boy who was always punctual and had never broken the curfew set by his parents. That day, he had left his friend's place, which was a few kilometers away from his home, at 9.30 p.m. and hitchhiked to get home. But by 10 p.m., he was still not home. The police immediately conclude that this is a runaway, so friends and family are left to search the area alone for 43 days. Then. Cédric's body is found charred in Albinon at an altitude of 1,600 meters. Three months later, the autopsy report rules that his death was an accident. The medical examiner suggested that he lit a fire and set his clothes ablaze, but he failed to explain why he would wander off so far from his home, something Miss Cédric never did. His parents were left stupefied. On November the 1st that same year in the Neuchâtel region, a half-naked Yves, then 16, makes a frantic call to his parents. He is shivering and it is the middle of the night. He tells his parents that he was hitchhiked by a young man with curly hair, who told him that he was an inmate on the run, before stopping in the middle of the forest. 
Once in the forest, the man pointed a gun at Eve's temple, raped him, and covered him in gasoline. However, as luck would have it, due to the rain, the kidnapper fails to ignite his matches and Eve manages to flee. When Eve tells the police this and even describes the Citroen car, they launch a search for witnesses, but nothing comes of it. In fact, investigators gave little credit to the teenager's story. Months passed until on March 15, 1987, a couple got into their car not far from Orsières in Valais. To their horror, they discover a body lying on a metal grid, partially burned, naked and gagged. The victim is identified as 16-year-old Vincent Puipe. He had spent the evening with his friends in a pub in Martigny when he hitchhiked to get home. The autopsy revealed that he was beaten, gagged, stripped and sodomized. Medical examiners even said that it is possible that the fire was the cause of the death, which is absolutely horrible. Unlike before, investigators do not simply dismiss this as yet another accident, but realize they may be on the footsteps of a true sadist. Then on April 24th, 1987, the next victim would surface. 16-year-old Michel, who worked as an apprentice mechanic, leaves the Fête du Soleil in Lausanne around half past midnight. He decides to hitchhike back to his home in Cugy in the Vaudois countryside. Soon, a car stops by the boy and he gets in. Once inside, the teenager quickly feels uneasy by the path the driver has chosen and also by his unwillingness to speak. Michel then realizes that the door has no handle and that he is essentially trapped. Again, a gun is quickly pointed at him and then the driver claims to be on the run. Around the area of Moudon, Michel, the victim, is then dragged outside the car, gagged with a stocking, tied up and raped. But he manages to break out of his cuffs upon which he receives 10 hammer blows, presumably to the head, and he is then thrown into the nearby river. As it was raining, the perpetrator again fails to use gasoline and Michel plays dead while the man tries to drown him. When the man eventually leaves, thinking that Michel is dead, Michel then walks for over an hour until he reaches Sauton, where he was then rescued and required 39 stitches. Michel managed to describe the man as best he could. He said that he was around 30, had curly light brown hair, was unshaven and wore a plaster near his mouth. He also said the man drove a light beige Peugeot 504. A wanted notice was then published in newspapers across Switzerland featuring the then unknown man's drawn portrait. After the perpetrator's portrait is published, it doesn't take long for Michel's family to grow suspicious given the strong resemblance between the drawing and their son. In fact, his family decides to sit down together to discuss whether this could really be their Michel. They study the portrait from all angles for a long time and then conclude that, in fact, it probably is Michel. They also talk about the many coincidences, such as the fact that Michel owns a Peugeot 504 and still has his old Citroën, which was mentioned by one of the survivors. At last, one of his older brothers, though torn, decides to completely denounce Michel and I suppose, though this isn't stated, report him to the police. The police then carry out a search of Michel's home, which he still shares with his parents at this point, but they weren't too suspicious of him at this point as he had never run into any problems with the law. Still, when authorities search his Peugeot, they find gasoline cans, cords, gagging tools and a hammer he used on young Michel. The police then also find that the door is indeed missing a handle, like young Michel said, and this is definitely too much of a coincidence. So they decided it is of paramount importance to catch Michel and at least bring him in for questioning before another teenager falls victim to his doings. And the police will be lucky. You see, at the time, Michel was actually serving his annual military obligations at a base in Shangnao in the Bernese countryside. This of course made finding him very easy. So on May 2, 1987, 28-year-old Michel is arrested, and when the police arrest him, they find a pair of handcuffs in his military bag, as well as the pistol used to threaten his victims. Michel's arrest came as a massive shock to his friends, who described him as a good friend and even entrusted their children to him. One of his friends, who stayed with Michel for six months in 1985, described him as, quote, very, very tender, but I felt that he was missing something in life. And he remembers that Michel had in his trunk 
two cans of gasoline, a rope and a flashlight. His friend however figured that all of this was for caving. His family too didn't see this coming. They described Michel as an adventurer, but also a serious and hard-working man, so absolutely nobody suspected his double life. After his arrest, his little brother, Claude Alain, discovered a copy of Hitler's Mein Kampf in Michel's belongings. In it, Michel had underlined many paragraphs and added lines saying, quote, 100% agree, and quote, to learn by heart. Surprisingly though, despite having hidden his killing spree, Michel confesses to police. He admits the attacks on Michel and Yves, as well as the murders of Vincent and Cédric, the latter which was then finally reopened and recognized as a murder, rather than an accident. During the interrogations, Michel was said to have appeared relieved and reportedly told officers, quote, If you had not stopped me, I would have murdered again. At the same time, it was evident that he got a certain thrill out of reliving his crimes, and while he was telling the police about them, he was sweating a lot and trembling. His modus operandi became clear to authorities. Most of his victims were teenagers who were violently beaten with a hammer, sodomized and set on fire. Before killing them, Michel tied their wrists and feet, gagged them with sponges, bandages and even plasters. Sometimes he tortured them to extremities, putting metal clamps on their nipples. He later stated that he would get into his car and look for a victim whenever he took his fancy, basically. He stated, quote, while I had these guys at my mercy, I felt revenge for all the frustrations I had endured. And I loved this feeling of dominance so much that I took a liking to it, and for me, it was like a drug. But with such passion for torture and killing, investigators began suspecting the worst, that Cédric was indeed not his first victim. His predatory profile actually led them to re-examine all unsolved or mysterious disappearances in the area but little did they know that Michel would not only frequent Switzerland. As the worst of his crimes took place in Valais, it is there that Michel's investigation was held. However, that didn't stop international investigators requesting an interview with him, and they did just that. First up was Joël Vaillant, who came to question Michel over similar hitchhiking disappearances in France, but Michel went on to deny all of those, and for good reason. A few months later, police arrested French serial killer Pierre Chanal for the murders. Meanwhile in Italy, the disappearance of 18-year-old Fabio Vanetti, who vanished on August 14, 1986 after missing his last train home, causes uproar in the country. Italian police officer Giorgio Galusero, having heard of Michel's case, travels to Switzerland to question him over the disappearance, however, while he is on his way, Michel confesses. He said that he hitchhiked Fabio, raped him and then burned his body. Later that day, Fabio's charred remains are found near a river. Galocero remembers that when interviewing Michel, quote, He was extremely calm, recounting in detail what he had inflicted on the victims. As police officers, we are trained in this sort of thing, but I must say that it was difficult to keep one's cool when listening to Michel. While Michel was happy to confess, he was just as happy to retract everything he said. In fact, whenever there was insufficient evidence, he would go back on his word and deny everything, sometimes even several times. Police would later learn that Michel began his criminal activities when he was just 22 years old, during a trip to the United States. While in Florida, he met Silvestri, a Canadian man who also happened to be a homosexual. On September the 1st, 1981, he smashed his head in with a hammer before burying his body after burning it. The man was never found. On February the 4th, 1983, he then also murdered a Frenchman called Frédéric in the Ancy region of France, as well as a young hitchhiker called Joël, who he killed in Switzerland's Jura area, and a young girl called either Anne Laure or Anne Fleur, Michel doesn't really remember her name very well, but she was the only woman he killed. Michel said that a woman was the one to approach him, which perhaps might be the case seeing as he wasn't really interested in women, and he felt that she laughed at his helplessness, but this he might have dreamt up or exaggerated given his past. He killed her on June 6, 1985 around Saint-Marie-de-la-Mer. On April 16, 1987, he killed a young Frenchman called Roger in Italy. A body was indeed found in the Como region of Italy thought to maybe be Roger, but it was never formally identified. A year prior, in July of 1986, 
He also spent a vacation in former Yugoslavia, where Swiss tourists saw him at Club Med with badly burned legs. Michel would later tell Galucero that those had been sunburns, but Galucero wasn't having any of it, he wasn't convinced. He said, quote, We immediately thought that these burns were probably linked to a crime, so we started questioning Michel. Michel then confessed to killing a young hitchhiker called Silvio while on vacation in Rijeka. It was there that he burned his legs while pouring gasoline over his victim. Michel then describes the murder and the scene of it in great detail, following which Galucero leaves to investigate with his Yugoslav colleagues, but a body is never found and as expected, Michel once again retracts his former confession. In total, Michel confesses to 11 crimes between 1981 and 1987, but would be tried only for four murders and two attempted murders in the end. Michel's trial took place on October 30, 1989 in Saint-Franchet, Valais, and would last only 30 minutes. In Valais, trials such as these are essentially written procedures and there is no spoken debate, so to speak, so it being quick is quite the norm. So despite this being the trial of the worst serial killer Switzerland has ever had and hopefully will ever have, it all boils down to a quick reading of the indictment and then to an equally quick questioning of the accused. At his trial, psychiatrists cited that Michel's mental disorder, if you will, was comparable to that of a person with an incomplete mental development, however he was not proclaimed as insane. He was then sentenced to life imprisonment, something he didn't want to hear to the point of holding his hands over his ears. According to reports, he would press his hands even tighter around his ears, as the prosecutor declared him to be, quote, a cold, calculating, selfish, cynical, perverse and empty being who joins the biggest criminals in history. Apparently, the prosecutor made it very obvious that if he had his wish, Michel would have received a death penalty. And many people can see why. In the past, Michel was housed in a high-security prison in the French-speaking part of Switzerland, costing some 500 Swiss francs or around 560 US dollars per day. And recently, he was moved to the German-speaking part, where he is costing taxpayers an astonishing 2,000 Swiss francs per day or around 2,200 US dollars per day. In prison, Michel is said to be a model prisoner, and in 2003, he made headlines again when he nearly died, though of what is not stated. He was then placed in intensive care, and the public was having none of it. They were absolutely shocked at the money spent by the Swiss to keep him alive. A year prior to that illness in 2002, following 15 years in prison, Michel could have theoretically been granted parole, but this was thankfully denied and it would be denied again in 2010, as the risk of re-offense is deemed too high with him. I mean, he even said so himself. In a later documentary on Michel, a psychiatrist would later say that Michel's murder spree and sadistic ways were deeply rooted in his childhood. But this is no excuse, I mean many people come from abusive homes and don't do what he did. You can always ask for help and should absolutely do so if you're unwell. For anyone watching, there is no shame in asking for help, it's a brave thing to do. In any case, this is it for today's case and I hope to see you on the next one. Bye!